Greetings, fellow Beyonders. I am your humble host and scribe, Sven, and this is Beyond the Worlds Beyond. The primary purpose of this series will be exploring the lore and story within these campaigns. In this episode, we'll be looking at the ninth episode of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One, titled The King of Cups. We'll be doing a quick summary of the episode, and then diving into the lore questions that it raises and those that it answers. We return to the revelation of the captured Naram and the party's reaction to him. Quick thinking and strong roles help distract Moro into thinking that Ame and Ursuline's horrified reactions are simple seasickness. Meanwhile, Suvi keeps him busy explaining his process and its results. Results with the potential to end the war on both fronts, if actually achievable. While well, Suvi starts off doing so as a distraction, she finds herself actually excited at the prospect, until reminded of the state of her friends. Knowing there is little they can do on the derrick, and using their seasickness as an easy excuse, the party returns to the Chantry. Here, they once more fall into conflict over their next course of action. Ame believes her duty dictates that she must act swiftly and intends to seek out Arima in the hopes she can free her beloved. Ursulon wants to retrieve Wavebringer and leave as soon as possible, feeling that they are not in a position to help and personally overwhelmed. Suvi, in turn, sides with Ursulon, especially since her duty is to end the war, and in her eyes, if Arima is powerful enough and intending to free Naram, she does not need their coaxing her aid in doing so. Ame reluctantly relents that Wavebreaker, at least, will be their first priority. Of course, the best laid plans of Wild Ones and Women. Drives and circumstances lead to the party being separated as the end of the day draws near. Suvi, seeking contact with the Citadel, encounters Galani and learns that the Citadel has been seeking her for nearly two weeks now and had her, feared her dead due to loss of contact. Going to the Governor's Mansion with Galani, Suvi is granted access to a speaking mirror to have a long overdue meeting with Steel. Her foster mother, understandably upset, begins to dress down Suverin. As Suvi recounts some of what she has counter encountered, Steele orders her to keep things static until she can arrive in two to three days' time. Unaware of this, and deep in his depression and his cups, Ursulon leaves the Chantry to seek out Gallows at the Ace of Wands. Despite his drunken state, the meeting goes even better than expected. Gallows, impressed at their speed in completing his task, hands over Wavebreaker as promised. He also gives Ursulon a marker a string from the rope that remained around his neck after he was hanged, and offers Ursulon future employment if he so desires. Damn, is this dude a badass or what? Ursulon declines for now, wanting to be done with the city as soon as possible, but the offer remains open. Similarly unaware, Ame had expressed her concerns and desires to the fox, that her true desire was to seek out the shrine amid the kudzu, find Arima, and convince her to save her beloved. Being at least somewhat a butthole and an agent of Ame's id, the fox tricks Ame into letting him out of the room at the Chantry. He then promptly flees into the city, towards the shrine, thus forcing Ame to pursue him, and do what she had truly wanted to do anyway. And thus, with everything except possibly the Derek very much not static, we end this week. Before we start asking new questions, let's take a look at the ones we've asked before and see which, if any, we now have answers for. We had asked how Suvi would react to Naram's capture, especially if it benefited the Empire. We learned that it is as conflicted as we would expect. She recognizes the wrong done and the harm it brings her friends, but cannot help but be excited at the prospect of ending the ongoing wars. This also addresses some of the questions we had about the wars, that both are currently in a lull, but far from being won by any side, and that naval battles are playing a primary role in the current phase. We had also asked the significance of Wavebreaker's name, and finally have some answers. That it originally belonged to Naram, along with two other artifacts gifted to him by his father, the King of Storms. It seems we will need to be keeping our eyes open for Sea Calmer and Mistcaller. 
I love Brennan bringing around the random decision to have Wavebreaker have a seven-fingered hilt, to that being the number of fingers for Naram, or at least his glamour. We were also wondering why Galani was present in meeting with the governor. I had assumed it couldn't be due to Subi's actions, meaning those at the Chantry, and in that minor regard I was correct, but in terms of the bigger picture, it was indeed the Citadel's search for Subi that brought her to Port Talon. Back when we were first introduced to the fox, we wondered if the fox represented those parts of themselves that the witches tend to repress. It definitely seems like that is partly the case with how the fox actively tricked Ame into doing what she wanted to do, but was holding back from for the sake of her friends. For new questions, the first, and most depressing to ponder, is if Ursuline's depression and reaction are more than just about Naram. He is asked pointedly what would he want if he was the one who was trapped. But there's the rub, he is one who is trapped. And the people who trapped him, though not knowingly or with ill intent, are the ones then trying to pose the question to him. I know if I was in his shoes, well, if shoes fit him, I would be in need of a drink as well. I actually submitted this one at the fireside, so fingers crossed those on the Patreon might find a perspective on it soon. We learn that, for some reason, Steel cannot travel to Silbury by travel door. Suvi attempted to inquire, but the topic shifted without it being answered. Why is the door inaccessible? Is it to do with the astronomical alignments required for its magics? Or is Silbury under attack? If the latter, who are the aggressors? We know the Port Talon trades with Galkmai, so presumably their fleets would not be vast distances away. And we've heard the importance of naval combat. Similarly, we know Ruve had at least one chalice active on the island, and it's hard to believe Emlis was the only infiltrator. Was she the harbinger of an assault from that angle? Or perhaps the issue is the proximity to Grandmother Wren's cottage and the forces that are moving against it. Which brings us to the next question. What exactly does Steele know about the cottage and what it contains? She was very intent on learning if the books and scrolls she gave Subi made it inside. Is this due to the knowledge they hold about other threats, or are they themselves a Trojan horse? I suppose it will depend whether Steele turns out to be hero, villain, or something much more grey. Similarly, she was well acquainted with Ame's ability to turn away unwanted guests now that the cottage is in her name, and recognize the King of Night from one of his many names. I do wonder if all this will circle back to a child's adventure, as well, only this time that of stone, soft, and steel with Grandmother Wren. Though, of course, such an adventure would not, in itself, tell us where steel now stands, but it would certainly explain her knowledge. That's all for this installment of Beyond the Worlds Beyond. As always, please feel free to throw your own questions and theories in the comments, as I love hearing what others latched on to. Also, please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you want more Worlds Beyond number content, you can also visit my Patreon, linked below, to find my appendix and timeline projects, all of which are free and publicly available. I've been your host, Sven, and thank you very much for listening. Farewell, for now, fellow Beyonders.